So Try Not to Try is about this concept way, and I realized at the end of my climb that I had lost all sense of time, that I had lost any sense of myself. Can you do ways very hard to do it from the computer or on your smartphone? And that's kind of the Japanese concept of forest bathing, right? Read a self-help book really pissed off when they got to the end because they're like, <laughs> there's no solution. She has a rule, and that is when you're at dinner, all the cell phones yeah. have to go under the center of the table. We could not be successful adults without this ability to delay gratification at the time. Prisoners were treated just unconscionably and horribly. And he saw this as a way that would, they could be more humanely treated. Stop pushing so hard. Go walk in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> this is what makes humans humans. Hi, I'm Jim O'Shaughnessy, and welcome to Infinite Loops. Sometimes we get caught up in what feel like infinite loops when trying to figure things out. Markets go up and down, research is presented and then refuted, and we find ourselves right back where we started. The goal of this podcast is to learn how we can reset our thinking on issues that hopefully leaves us with a better understanding as to why we think the way we think and how we might be able to change that to avoid going in infinite loops of thought. We hope to offer our listeners a fresh perspective on a variety of issues and look at them through a multifaceted lens, including history, philosophy, art, science, linguistics, and yes, also through quantitative analysis. And through these discussions help you not only become a better investor, but also become a more nuanced thinker. With each episode, we hope to bring you along with us as we learn together. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode of Infinite Loops. Jim O'Shaughnessy is chairman and co-chief investment officer of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, where Jamie Catherwood is an associate. All opinions expressed by Jim, Jamie, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with another episode of Infinite Loops. I am getting the absolute best guest. And, you know, I was chatting with my son and when this first began and he goes, why are you doing this podcast at? And I said, honestly, so that I can chat with super smart people who can teach me things. And boy, do they, do I have one of those. My guest today is Edward Slinger, Slingerland. We'll work on that. Slingerland. Professor at the University of British Columbia and author of Trying Not to Try and Drunk. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So I love your work. I myself have read the Tao Te Ching since I was 18 years old. I finally started to figure out what it actually meant when I was in my mid 50s. It took me a long time. Oh, you should let me know that. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. To, let's put it this way. My interpretation of what it, what it means to me. And I love the idea that you present that it, you call the paradox, right? So Wu Wei, which it translates a lot of different ways. I'm going to let you take our listeners and viewers through it. I'd also like it if you wouldn't mind, you did a great job of looking at this idea of actionless activity through the lens, not only of Lao Tzu, but of Confucius, of Beyonce, et cetera. If you could give us an overview of what we're going to be talking about in terms of this idea of effortless activity flow, like there's a lot of different names, but we're going to talk about those and how they differ from it later on. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the concept, so try not to try is about this concept way in Mandarin. So literally no doing or no action or no trying. It's sometimes translated as non-action, which I think is misleading because it typically refers to a state where I translate it as effortless action. So it's a state where you lose a sense of yourself as an agent, you don't notice the passing of time, you're completely unselfconscious, and yet you're completely successful. Everything you do, you're physically skilled in the world, and crucially, and this 
for the early Chinese, you're very skillful in the social world. So you are charismatic, people trust you, everything kind of works out. So they, the early Chinese, both the Confucians and the Taoists, and one of my, my dissertation project, which turned to my first book, one of the novel arguments I was making there is that people tend to associate Wu Wei with Taoism, broadly understood. So, I mean, Taoism is just this label that we put respectively on these thinkers like Lao Tzu or Zhuang Tzu are the kind of two major figures, but they weren't part of a self-identified school. This is Taoism was invented by Han librarians, basically. When they're trying to figure out where to put these books in the shelf, they came up with a label for them. But, you know, there's a reason they got put together. There are some commonalities between Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu. And Wu Wei has always been associated with them. But what I was arguing in my dissertation and first book, and I argue as well in trying to try, is that the Confucians actually also had Wu Wei as an ideal state. They just had a different idea about how you get there. They were really more focused on active trying. Very roughly speaking, the Confucians think you need to try not to try. And I think you need to stop trying. The reason, and one of the other arguments in my earlier work was that a lot of the theorizing in early China, so debates about self-cultivation, about human nature, one, one coherent way to see them is as these attempts to solve what I call the paradox of Wu Wei. So if you have as your goal being spontaneous, you want to be spontaneous, you want to get the benefits of being spontaneous, you face a tension, a real, and it's a real paradox of how can you try not to try? How can you consciously try to be unselfconscious? And then try not to try, I point out, it's a genuine paradox. It's not just a word play and it falls out of the structure of our mind. So we, if I tell you, relax, be spontaneous, the part of your brain I'm activating, very roughly the prefrontal cortex, kind of the executive control part of the brain. The part I'm activating when I tell you that is the part we want to shut down. So it's very similar to the, the late social psychologist Dan Wagner talked about the white bear paradox. If I say, don't think of a white bear, you are thinking of a white bear, just put the <laughs> exactly. in your mind. It's the same problem with trying not to try. And so I argue in the book, it's a direct, it's a real direct paradox to try to use your mind to shut your mind down. And so, so when I walk through then is the various strategies that the early Confucians and Taoists came up with to kind of trick you into not thinking about it, to kind of get you around it in an indirect way. And they often involve using the body as a way to shut the mind down. So the Confucians give you rituals to do and music to listen to chanting to do. The Taoists, it's a little less clear what they're having you do, but some of it clearly involves meditating, sitting meditation, maybe breathing practices. So they're giving you these bodily techniques. In a way, it's like using the body as a workaround to get around this problem of the mind, shutting the mind down. So that's what trying not to try out is about these, these various strategies that the early Chinese came up with. And each has their strengths and weaknesses. And none of them is a solution because, I mean, this is the disappointing part of the book and marketed when it first came out as a self-help book. And people who read a self-help book were really pissed off when they got to the end because they're like, <laughs> there's no solution. Is it is a real paradox? And so there are these kind of strategies, but, you know, at the end of the day, it is a real, it remains a real paradox. But, you know, at least having, seeing the importance, the, I think the crucial message of trying not to try is that the Chinese, early Chinese were right in identifying the importance of spontaneity and the fact that there are certain goals in life that you can only attain through not trying. So things like happiness or trust or love and, or creativity, creative insights. And the problem with our society, I think, is that we really focus on striving and trying. And if you're not doing well, try harder. So I do think it's helpful for us to realize that in certain domains of life, the way to succeed is to stop pushing so hard and to somehow figure out how to let go. That's the, that's kind of the big take home.
yeah, wrote a thread called uh, Trying Not to Try. I guess it's an homage and uh, completely concur. It is, a, it is truly a paradox. And I was familiar with all of the various methodologies that people suggested for doing it, but you're right. Like when you do get to the end, it's like I quoted, I think from the little prince, like it's one of those things that you can only see out of the corner of your eye yeah. and that if yeah. you turn and look, it disappears. And so yeah. I've also like tried to incorporate some things that we're going to talk about in a bit, your work on the unconscious and how you try to unite or at least communicate better with the unconscious, which is also maddening at many times. I wonder, I, is there a Western equivalent of trying not to try? You know, the ancient Greeks had the Aristia moment, right? Where that was the moment in battle where the, the hero lost any thought of himself and was said to be divinely inspired and that led him to effortless supremacy. So that was the ancient Greeks. Then now we see a lot of people talking about slack, talking about flow. How do you think that these differ from the Chinese concept? Well, the, so certainly the ancient Greeks valued this kind of spontaneity, not just in battle, but if you look at Aristotle, he thinks that the truly virtuous person one of the hallmarks of a true virtue is that is what we would call wei, using Chinese terminology, right? A, a truly jet brave person doesn't calculate and have to kind of force themselves into battle. The truly brave person, when danger calls, just plunges in and kind of knows what the right thing to do is, right? So a hallmark of virtues for Aristotle is that they're spontaneous at a certain level. And he actually, I argue in my, my academic work that he faced a very similar paradox. So, you know, he, he how to teach someone to be just, if they're not already naturally just, it seems like the training is going to mess it up. So he, anyone who's concerned with character states, anyone who's concerned with turning you into a different type of person than you are and giving you sincerely new dispositions is going to face this paradox. And so the ancient Greeks faced it. So the medieval Christian thinkers faced it because they wanted you to really accept Christ and not because you're afraid of hell or you want to go to heaven, but just because you really, you know, love. You need to create love in someone that's not there already. How do you create that love? So they had this problem too. So, so lots of cultures, any culture that's focusing on changing your dispositions is going to run into this problem. I think the reason that kind of started philosophical concern is because of the rise in the enlightenment of these hyper-rationalist models of ethics, where it's about, so in trying to try, I talk about, you know, you very loosely, you can call it conscious versus unconscious or system one, the more fast, hot, unconscious system versus system two. The models that became dominant in the enlightenment in Europe were very much system to top-down rationalist conscious models. So how do you know what the right thing to do is? You consult the historical imperative and, you know, it tells you what the maxim is that you need to follow. Or, you know, that's deontology. How do you know what the right thing to do is? Look at the situation, calculate the costs and benefits, do the math, then you'll know what the right thing to do is. They're all very reliant on the conscious mind. And not only don't have anything to say about changing the dispositions, they're actually a little bit suspicious about that approach. And so Kant's very worried about dispositional approaches to ethics. And so they don't have the try not to try problem because trying is cool for them. It's all yeah. the thing all the time. So that's, I think, why we've kind of stopped worrying about this paradox in our conscious lives or kind of literature and philosophy. Where it survived is in sub-communities that are very much grappling with the problem of getting into spontaneity. So athletes who are worried about falling out of the zone or choking, performers who know that they're only going to be good. You know, the people I probably heard from most after trying not to try were people who did improv and they were just like, this is 
there's a central tension we face. It's, you know, you go out there, you can't be trying, but, you know, if it doesn't come, you get nervous and you want to try. So, so communities that depend on spontaneity have always been aware, have remained aware of this tension and called it by very, but I think that it's remained alive. And then, you know, another big hallmark was Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's work on flow, where he made this concept part of mainstream psychology again. And I think that was a very important moment as well. But I am careful in the book, I want to distinguish Uwe from flow, because I think that, I mean, basically, I think Csikszentmihalyi got it slightly wrong in terms of characterizing it. So, so if flow has all the it's, it is the same state as Uwe, right? It's your unselfconscious, lose a sense of time, everything works out. Chiksumihai wanted to distinguish flow from just zoning out, right? He didn't want, you, if you sit on your phone and you're scrolling through Twitter for two hours or watching stupid cat videos on YouTube, he didn't want to call that flow, even though it's got some of the hallmarks, right? You lose a sense of time, you kind of lose a sense of yourself. And so he, what he landed on as the difference was complexity and challenge. So he thought flow states were about constantly ramping up the challenge and complexity so that you were engaged, but it wasn't too hard. It wasn't so hard that you got frustrated. It wasn't too easy that you got bored. And his model was like, you know, rock climbing or sports, where you're always having to kind of ramp things up to get engaged. And even as an undergraduate, when I, Flow came out when I was finishing my undergrad degree, and I actually went to, one of my friends in grad school was Mihai Chicks Mihai's son, Mark. Mm. <laughs> so ah, I went cool. to school with his son. And, you know, even then I thought there was something wrong with that view, even based on the examples he gave. So one of his examples in that, the original Flow book, the one that was so popular, is about Serafina, I think her name is, this a woman who lives in the Italian Alps. And she gets up every morning and does the same thing she does every day. She leads the cows to pasture. She, you know, wheat, cards, wool. She does these things she's done every day and will continue to do. And she gets into flow doing those things. And I remember thinking, there's not a lot of, it's not like rock climbing. It's not like she's always having to like lead the cows to a more challenging pasture to remain in flow. It's pretty simple stuff. And then after flow, there's there came, a lot of data came in. So Chicks behind his colleagues started polling people on, you know, tell us when you were in flow, what you were doing. And what people report is they tend to get in flow in situations like playing with children or hanging out with friends and chatting about nothing. These, this is also not rock climbing or, you know, professional sports. This is very simple stuff. And so this is where I think I argue in the book that Uwe is a more helpful concept in the sense that the hallmark of Uwe is, is that for them, it's a religious framework. So you're in Uwe because you're absorbed in the Tao, the way, right? The kind of cosmic way. Converting this, I think, into naturalistic language, I argue that th what this corresponds to is you get into Uwe or proper flow when you're absorbed in something bigger than yourself that you value, that you think is important. And so if I spend two hours coding, and maybe it's not complex coding, but I've solved a problem that I really cared about, or I've contributed to a charity that needed my help, you know, I come out of that feeling pretty good about myself, but that's because the thing I was doing was valuable and I about in retrospect, I value it. If I spend two hours watching cat videos and eating Doritos, I come out of that feeling kind of gross and t tired rather than energized. That's because I, back at that, I don't, I wasn't absorbed in something that I valued. So I think I'm arguing that flow is a really important concept, but we need to understand it slightly differently than chicks and me hide to find it. It's really about being absorbed in something bigger than you that you value. It, that's an excellent uh, distinction. And my personal experience with, I guess we'd call it flow, was in fact, it was, I wasn't rock climbing, but I was climbing as a young man up a very steep incline that went down to the Mississippi River. 
And I realized at the end of my climb that I had lost all sense of time, that I had lost any sense of myself, that all of my movements and everything weren't planned. They just happened, right? And as this was like a, an 80 degree or 75 degree angle. So you had to literally yeah. use the trees as ways to pull yourself up. And I remember when I get to got to the top, I still remember this, even though I think I was 20 or 21, I, how good I felt. I just yeah. felt like amazingly good. And so like I contemplated that for the rest of my walk back to my house, because it was just like. Oh, I got to get some more of this. Yeah. And yeah. it's easier, it's easier to get when you're out in nature too, because nature by, you know, it is bigger than you <laughs> by definition, well, right? And that's kind of the Japanese concept of forest bathing, right? Where you're just meant to kind of go out and don't have an agenda, just wander around yeah. in the woods. I, I find yeah. that too is quite lovely in the way if you just like, it does kind of shut off your prefrontal cortex. Yep. And, you know, do you think that there are other, so, so in this instance, me climbing up that hill or rock climbing, forest bathing, walking in the forest without an agenda, are there any other external stimuli? And I want to reserve uh, booze and alcohol because we're going to talk yeah. about your work there. So are there any other external stimuli that are not mood altering. So we'll put to the side alcohol, psychedelics, et cetera. How about other external things that people, especially Westerners, who are going to be the majority of the people listening to our discussion, could you know, seek out that might help them get into this state more easily? Well, I think nature is the most obvious one, right? Going as far as sitting on a beach in the ocean, immediately, at least for me, puts me to these states. Doing stuff, so my, probably my next trade book is going to be about the importance of contact with the physical world. So simple tasks that are connecting you to physical stuff, like weeding garden or chopping vegetables. And, you know, cooking can do this to you. Dogs and kids are pretty useful. <laughs> Because they don't, yeah, being around other living creatures that are social and don't have PFCs is helpful. So I think that's why playing with kids often gets you into the state. And, you know, social interaction when it's genuine and easy puts you in the state as well. So, you know, interacting with people you, you genuinely connect with and don't have to exert executive function to socialize with. You know, this is typically, you know, inside of a good friend and somebody who, is effortless to, to hang around with. So I think everybody knows who those people are in their lives. And those are good ways to get into a way. But it's very hard to do, getting into a way is very hard to do in front of the computer or on your smartphone. And I think that's one of the problems we face now. I think, you know, in previous generations, I'm old enough to be that previous generation. You know, I'm when I was in college, we didn't have smartphones. And so no matter how busy my day at school was I had built in downtime, like at the very least walking from class to class, I would mind wander and look at the trees and wonder about the weird squirrels. Where do they live in the winter? You know, you just, you have enforced downtime at certain points of the day that my students don't have because when they walk from class to class, they're on their smartphones the whole time, you know, checking Instagram or doing whatever. And so I think it's, I think one key is to just disconnect from artificial devices and engage with the physical world is a good way to start. Yeah. I have kind of an idea. It does not, I can't elevate it to thesis yet because I don't, I'm not sure that it can be negated. But so my generation, when I was going to college, we barely had computers. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Obviously, I graduated in 1982, but well, I was meant to graduate in 1982. I did a lot of downtime <laughs> and ultimately got my degree in 85. But so, I mean, 
we still type things on typewriters, right? Because yes. of course we had computers. I had one of the first one because I thought they were so cool. But my thesis about the cell phone is that, so I'm 62 and the cell phone, even though I have it near me most of the time, I don't use this device to look at Twitter, to look at Instagram, to look at any of those things. I think, and you can correct me because you probably know better than me, but I think that this idea of the, well, it, zombie is too strong a term, of the mindless movement like this, it could either hypnotize you and like maybe that's part of flow. My point being, though, that I grew up in an era way before even cell phones. And yeah. so I, I think I am or correlate it with like using a computer to look at Twitter yeah. and things like that. The other thing that I'm probably more correlated with just because of my age and when I grew up is the idea, for example, if my wife comes in, I immediately shut the computer screen, look at her and we have a conversation. Do you think that, do you think it is kind of what cohort you grew up in? Do you think like if younger people just said, you know what, my daughter, for example, she's a young millennial, so she's 27, 26 now. She has a rule, and that is when you're at dinner, all the cell phones yeah. have to go into the center of the table. Are those yeah. things helpful for the younger people who, are, who grew up on the scrolling methodology as opposed to the computer? Yeah, no, it's definitely a generational difference. My daughter's going to be 16. She's grown up in an era of smartphones. She does everything on the phone. And I feel old fashioned because I'm like you, I would need to get on a laptop, you know, and then, you know, Socrates would be horrified by that. Who <laughs> shouldn't be using writing at all. So, you know, there's always this kind of every generation is grumpy about new technology that the new generation's using. I just find I can't. I don't like, I'd like to type, but I think that they, because they're the difference with the smartphone. So, okay, maybe it's just a new technology that old people are grumpy about, but I don't think so. I think there's actually a qualitative difference because it's, because you can have it with you all the time and it's so addictive. It really is designed by really clever engineers to addict you. And so, that's where I think people who have grown up with it and really are drawn to living in the smartphone world need strategies. And this is kind of the Confucian approach is where you have rituals. You do and certain you do things. And so with my daughter, it's always been since she's little, you know, no cell phones at the table. So you're just not allowed to have a cell phone at the dinner table. But, you know, it's it creeps into all sorts of things. We, she takes it on walks and she'll look at it. I think also people differ in their proneness. Even I have colleagues and friends who are my cohort, they're my age group, and are kind of, I notice, are noticeably more addicted to their phones than I am. You know, they'll, you can almost see if they put it away for a little bit because it's a meal or something. Any chance to something up or check something they'll do it it's almost like they just need a little bit arrow <laughs> just need a little bit <laughs> and so it's i think it requires discipline and conscious strategies and the other thing we've always done with my daughter is you know no cell phone in her room at night so at night she plugs it in the living room and it doesn't come out again until the morning and i think that's helpful too but you need to actually come up with conscious top-down pfc driven strategies because it is such an addictive thing. Yeah. I, I'm fascinated by it because I also think that the digital natives like your daughter do have some pretty amazing skill sets that my generation can only look on in and wonder the ability, the creative ability, which I think is interesting to, I have a young person who worked for me and like I, he's a, He's an artist, a digital artist, but, you know, so I asked him, how long would it take you to, you know, do, and I was asking for a, an image that actually turned to animation. Right. And he's like, oh, and he literally, we were on a zoom. Yeah. No, they, and he just showed yeah. it to me and I'm like, okay. So yeah. I wonder just to get back to the whole concept that we're talking about, why do you think 
that of all of the various schools in the early China where all of this kind of got started, why do you think that Confucianism and Taoism are the one, like verse legalism or some of the other Chinese traditions that you don't hear too much about these days? But I find that a well-educated Westerner certainly knows about Confucianism. And most of the people I chat with know about Taoism as well. Why the longevity in those two particular schools? That's a bit of a puzzle. So it is in the Warring States period that there were schools of, for instance, logic. There was a school of logician. You were very rationalistic, looked a lot like Western philosophers in certain ways. And that school didn't survive Moism. It may have been a historical accident. So they, one thing about the Moism since they were very organized and one, because of their utilitarianism, they were dedicated to defensive warfare and were organized into these very disciplined units. And so they got systematically wiped out by the first emperor, Qin, because he saw them as a threat. So that it may have just been a historical accident if these guys were too organized. And so, so yeah, I don't know why, you know, rationalism and the kind of abstract mode of doing philosophy didn't become dominant in China. Legalism is a tricky thing to talk about because it kind of, it didn't officially survive, but it really did. So, you know, Conf Confucianism, when we think of imperial Confucianism, the way it actually functioned as a state ideology was a kind of convenient mixing of Confucianism and legalism. So, you know, the Han dynasty, the Qin dynasty, the first unified dynasty in China was explicitly modeled on legalist principles. And the Han, at a certain point, took over, wanted to distinguish themselves from the Qin and say, well, we're, you know, then, you know, so, but they inherited all these legalist institutions from the Qin and kept them in place. And so, so the actual way China has been run for millennia has been a mixture of kind of legalist principles on the ground, but a Confucian or Buddhist Confucian flavored ideology. So it's these other schools have survived. They just aren't as prestigious or officially as recognized as Confucianism and Taoism. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. And I, you're right about the legalist tradition kind of imbuing everything that if you're looking at China, I'm an amateur, you're the expert. But yeah, I found that very interesting. You also mentioned utilitarianism, which here in the West, Jeremy Bentham is probably best known for. And I was looking at, I'm very interested in artificial intelligence. And one of my beliefs is that the more open the better. In other words, the more cognitive diversity, the more people from different cultures who have the opportunity to interact with it, the better, because I would be very presumptuous of me to say that I know what all the good use cases are going to be. Of course, I don't. I probably don't even know 0.00001% of them. And I like the idea of the collective humanity, if you will, having the ability to have access to these tools. The reason I bring that up is because like Benton came up with the Panopticon and I use the Panopticon as an example of what closed AI controlled by a few looks like. And I have soon to be five grandchildren in June. And like, if I can do anything that, that makes it so they don't live in a world that is ruled by a Panopticon AI, God damn it, I'm going to do that thing. So- mm -hmm. I wonder sometimes, like, the reason I'm asking is, so so Benton and the Panopticon, when he came up with that idea, it was truly for humane reasons, right? He, mm -hmm. If you read what he says about it, he was trying to solve an ugly and horrible problem in not only Britain, but in, in Europe in general at the time. Prisoners were treated just unconscionably and horribly. And he saw this as a way that would, they could be more humanely treated. But then, of course, it morphs into the all-seeing eye and, and mm -hmm. you know, the, our human nature of not knowing if we're being watched and just defaulting to the idea that we're always being watched, which is not great for human beings. And so to tie it together, what do you think about, like, so, so are a lot of these ideas that kind of were originally meant for one type of state rule, like we're talking about the Chinese or societal mores, if you will, 
do they do things change over time to a point where all of that used to be incredibly valuable is maybe not so much when you see it in a different light, like I'm mentioning the Panopticon. Yeah, it's interesting that Watson, the Confucian utilitarian, essentially had a version of the Panopticon. So he <laughs> has a whole chapter, Ghosts, it's called Ghosts or Spirits, where he's arguing, he's arguing against this growing disbelief in spiritual beings that he saw around him. He's a bit of a fundamentalist, and he really believes it's important for public morality that people believe that there are ghosts and spirits everywhere, watching them all the time. <laughs> and they're kind of like, you know, the heavenly secret policemen who are going to be watching and making, punishing you if you're doing bad. So utilitarianism has often gone, and you know, along with either legalist ideas or ideas that the way to get a good state is to carefully police people's behavior. And that's going to require surveillance and strict rules, reward and punishment. That's a, it's a very ancient idea. You know, you see it all the way back in early China. I think the problem with it is that I, I think that the intuition that the right way to, to regulate society is through new norms. So getting people to embrace certain values that they then you know, are self-activating, that are away, that are spontaneous. It's, you know, the way to get good people is to turn people into good people and not through external reward and punishment. But, you know, the problem with that is it's kind of loosey-goosey and <laughs> maybe it doesn't work as well. I don't know if it works as well. So, you know, you look at modern China, modern China is not a very way place. It is, it looks a lot like free. So it would like, you know, pervasive surveillance, very strict rules, very strict social control, very little individual freedom. So, so that's the other thing too, is some people, you know, just because Confucianism and Taoism started at a certain point in China, you know, in the fourth, fourth, fifth century BC, it doesn't mean modern China is like that at all. Certainly the modern mainland China is not like this. So yeah, this idea of a kind of police state is, can have very, you know, nice, motives at first. So, I mean, Maltza really was genuinely upset about the inequality and the pain and suffering that he was seeing around him. And he wanted to fix it so that people would be better off. But his solution was essentially creating a police state. Yeah. I, I herald from the sort of freedom maximalist side of things. And I yeah. think that most systems are complex and adaptive. And if you understand complex adaptive systems, you know that all emergence and new things comes from the bottom, not from the top. And that one of the ways to get to maximize that is to give a huge variety of people of very different dispositions and aptitude and, you know, passions, access to things and let the great ideas flow. Now, I realize that is also somewhat utopian and it's in its thinking process, we have to have rules and regulations. And I'm absolutely aware of that. And, but I do think, you know, elsewhere you talk about honest and there's, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that we as a species, human beings, we default to honesty and we default to honesty for a very good reason, in my opinion. And one that can be supported by, you know, looking at evolution, looking at our beginnings in hunter-gatherer tribes, in that we are a very unexpected apex predator on a planet. When you look at, like, our physical attributes and endowments, they ain't all that good <laughs> unless we are collectively acting together, right? Using all of the tools, including our mind and our consciousness to do better than a more naturally gifted by nature, like a, a lion or a tiger or, you know, with the jaws and the claws. And so I wonder, it kind of leads me into our, uh, the next thing I want to talk to you about, which is the limits of rationality, which is something that I'm absolutely fascinated by because I tend to be a, I started life as a rationalist and uh, I'm not that anymore. I don't really even know what I am. 
I am definitely have over a long period of time made efforts to, you know, rewrite my mental models to bring the unconsciousness into play in, in a variety of ways. By the way, that's really hard. And, but I also kind of like this idea of imbued or saturated intuition. In other words, so I've been doing what I do for a long, long time. And what I find and have found is that the more I do what I do, the more my intuitions about certain things get better and better. Now, I still have that rationalist side because I write them down because I'm swayed by the work of Will Storer, who wrote the book, Scientific Storytelling and the Status Game, who is a guest on the podcast in which he basically shows all of the studies that show, you know, our brains thinks they're doing us a kindness when they like, when we're wrong about something and they erase that, that memory, they only tell us, oh, when we were right, they remind us, you were right, you were right. And so that's one of the reasons why I try to keep myself honest by like writing down an intuition and then saying, was it right or wrong? And I wonder Right now, there's the whole McGilquist tribe looking at, you know, we're too left-brained. And to a certain extent, I agree with that. I think that a holistic approach using, if you can, you know, the entire brain. You mentioned dogs earlier, and I just had, my unconscious is poking me and saying, Jim, say this thing about dogs. So I believe that dogs are natural Taoist sages. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and actually spending time with a dog is just like such a wonderful experience. If you try to like, I've sat and watched dogs and it's just, they're so immediate and they're so natural, spontaneous themselves. And I'm talking and usually dogs that are highly trained, obviously that is the case, but back to Miguel Quist, the, the right and left brain, like. One of the things that I have a hard time with is I'm seeing, not him per se, but like some of his, his true believers, like almost trying to make a villain out of the left brain, a villain or out of the concept of, you know, basically abstraction. I, I personally mm -hmm. think that we need both. I personally believe that without abstraction, we don't know anything about quantum physics. We don't know any, which by the way, quantum physics, when like, if you like overdose on Lao Tzu and then you think, oh, I'll do some science. And then you go and read some of the quantum theorists. They're all like saying the same thing. You know, Schrodinger is saying, if you add up all of the minds in the world, it equals one. So non-dual, right. but who came up with the hidden variables theory, very out there in terms of he truly believes that I think is a very interesting thesis and I'm, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't have the capacity to say this is right or wrong, but this idea that the universe is interactive and connected, right? Like you, you and me are, we're seeing duality where it doesn't exist. So I know that's a long way into the rationality, but I made a point that I thought was really excellent and it was the hot and cold distinction. In other words, I guess, I guess Danny Kahneman would call it a system one and system two, but talk a little bit about that and how people could better like incorporate that into their everyday life. So the, yeah, this idea that the abstract thought or left brain is the villain, it's the villain and for certain goals. So it's important to think from an evolutionary perspective, why we have prefrontal cortex in the first place, right. right? And this maybe is a natural segue into drunk because this is this becomes an important issue with drunk. The PFC is crucial. We could not be successful adults without this ability to delay gratification, suppress certain things and replace it with another impulse to plan for the future, to think abstractly. This is what makes humans humans. So it's a, it's also a very expensive part of the brain. So it wouldn't be there if it wasn't doing something crucial. So I think that any kind of coherent story about the self has to give a role to cold cognition and system two cognition. We don't want to, we don't want the world run by a bunch of four-year-olds. <laughs> 
adult bodies, right? Right. Which right. happened relatively recently in the United States. <laughs> um, and, it's uh, not that, not right? too good of fact. Uh, somebody without a PFC, basically. So we need the PFC. The role of the PFC is to also help shape the system one system. So, you know, we, when you talk about, you said something about your intuition is getting better over time in a domain. I mean, this is a skill acquisition, right? Skill acquisition typically involves system two exertion, cognitive control. If I'm learning how to play tennis, I need to really pay attention to how I've been told to hold the racket and how to step through and how to hit the ball. I have different models for, you know, windshield wiper, try to get the, you have all these kind of conscious things you're thinking of that you're trying to then impose on your body. And that's the only way to learn how to play tennis. You can't just go out and start swinging a racket. So that's, and that's system two based. It's called cognition. And yet to get good at tennis, you have to da essentially download that into your hot cognition and make it automatic. And once you get really good, once you become an expert, then system two does become the enemy. So this is what happens with choking. There's really good, Locke has got a great book called Choke, I think, or Choking, where she looks at the literature on sports choking. And the best way to screw up a professional athlete is to get them to engage their cold cognition. So supposedly McEnroe, who was a dick, <laughs> would do this to people. <laughs> he was, right. if they were serving, if they were serving really well, he would, when they switch sides, he'd be like, Hey, your serve's really great today. What are you doing differently? <laughs> and they start thinking, I don't know. What am I doing differently? And then they would ruin their serve, right? So, so it's a delicate balance, right? You need you need cold cognition to develop any, any kind of new skill, which all humans do. I mean, we're completely dependent on learning our artificial skills to survive in the world. We're not born with everything we need online. So there are a lot of species in the world that don't need cold cognition because they've got everything they need built into system one. And we're not, for whatever reason, we didn't take that evolutionary path. We developed this prefrontal cortex and the ability to abstract and the ability to exert cognitive control and change our hot systems. So that's a, you have to value that as part of what makes us human. So I think the key is knowing what the function of the PFC is in what kinds of situations we need it, but also in what kind of situations it's good to shut it down. And that's where, you know, humans have developed various technologies doing that. And some of them are these kind of meditative techniques or ritual things getting involved in the world. And some of them, we've also figured out that we can use chemical substances to do this. Yeah. The, the drunk, one of my researchers said to me, ask him how drunk he was when he broke drunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's actually a really good question because it's, it's, this is actually not in the book, but I had written these 10, probably 10 versions of the book proposal for drunk. And my agent kept sending it back to me and she was like, nah, boring. <laughs> okay. And she was right. It was not all the science was there. All the arguments were there. The, Everything was there, but it wasn't this very plotting, like, here's the problem. Here's why the problem's interesting. You know, here's some ideas about it. And it just was, it was boring. It was logically consistent, but it lacked oomph. And I realized I, it's because I hadn't taken my own advice in the book and I hadn't written any of it drunk. So what I needed was actually something unexpected and catchy. And so I was on a business trip. This was pre-COVID and I was meeting some colleagues, but I had a couple hours before dinner. And so I went down to the hotel lobby with my laptop and ordered a Negroni. And by the end of my Negroni, probably at about 0.08 blood alcohol content, about when I sh you know, should not have been operating a motor vehicle, what's, what is now the first two pages of the book just popped into my head. And I really, the phenomenological experience was that I was just taking dictation. I was just writing down something that some part of my brain was telling me. And, you know, everyone remarks on the beginning of the book, how it just sucks you in, it's engaging. That was produced at 0.08 blood alcohol content. And it's the kind of just coming in from a weird direction thing that's hard to get on coffee. Yeah. You just, you know, 
thinking completely in a PFC driven way. Yeah. I'd love that. So I'm, I will tell him, I'm very happy that I asked him and I'm going to text him right after we're done and tell him he had a really great answer for that. You know, I think it's probably apocryphal, but the story that I'm familiar with about Alexander the Great and his generals, I'm sure you've heard it, right? Where they made their battle plans in, in the bright sun of daylight and they were all being rational and, you know, this is why we should do this. But then they would get incredibly drunk that night. And yeah. the story as I've heard it is if they woke up in the morning, still committed to the battle plan after having discussed it while they were drunk, it was a go. Yeah. But if they yeah. woke up in the morning with misgivings, it was scratched. Is that a true story? Is that a true story? I, I don't think we know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds right. like exactly the kind of thing. I've heard the exact same story attributed to the Persians, the people right. are yeah. fighting. Yeah, so exactly. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's the important thing. And I've heard it said about the German Visigoths, you know, according to Tacitus. So it's right. been That's said right. about a lot of different people. Uh, so I think it's just a, probably lots of people do this. And it just gets a tribute. Whenever someone's really successful, you're like, like, well, what's their trick? And one of those tricks is contemplating things while drunk. So, you know, one of the, so one of the main themes of drunk is that even though we've been told from a scientific that our taste for intoxicants is an evolutionary mistake, that's a mistake. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> it can't be right because, because alcohol is so costly and it's really quite dangerous substance. And so the fact that the taste for it has remained in our gene pool and in our cultural repertoire means there have to be some adaptive benefits that it's serving. And I talk about a bunch of the benefits, but one of the crucial ones is this, the creativity thing or the insight thing. So we, you know, the, again, the PFC is great for a lot of things, but one of the problems, many problems with it is it interferes with or suppresses creative thought. So, so kids, I look at data that this is Alison Gopnik's work, work at UC Berkeley. Little children are great at lateral thinking tasks. So tasks where to solve it, you have to come up with an unusual thing that's kind of hard, that you need an insight to so see. You can't just logically churn through it. Four-year-olds are great at these tasks and our, our performance on them goes down linear fashion as pH. And in the book, I lay down on top of that, you know, our PFC maturation. <laughs> so basically, as our PFC is maturing, we get less and less creative. And this is because evolution's got this trade-off design problem where it wants us to have cold cognition, but not too soon. And it's kind of slow walks the development because the PFC is the last part of a human being to develop. It's the last right. part of the brain to develop and well after your body is fully mature. Yeah. So it, it clearly is because evolution's got, we need to be open to things. We need to be able to learn new things. We have to trust people. So it wants to slow walk the development of the PFC. And so then as an adult, you've got this problem where you're stuck with this PFC that you do need, but then you still confront situations where you need lateral insight. You need to be able to see new possibilities. You have to see the whole realm of possible factors that normally the PFC is just focusing you on task relevant stuff. And so what we figured out is we can use a tool like alcohol to just turn the PFC down for a little bit, <laughs> you know, three hours, yep. we're back like a four-year-old again in certain ways. And then, you know, hey, that battle flat plan the PFC came up with, you know, Basically, you're consulting your unconscious and saying, what do you think about that? And your unconscious may pull up some stuff that you hadn't considered. And so that, you know, this, this story is probably apocryphal, but it captures a really important function of alcohol, which is that it's a way to temporarily turn down our PFC so that we can get creative insights when we need them. Yeah. And I find that and your argument absolutely fascinating because I a, agree with it. I think that the ability that external chemicals can allow us at, to, you know, push it down. But then I wonder, because I, you know, I've seen some literature that says, and I have a, I, I know this is N equals one, so it can't, I can't extend it, 
but it's interesting observation from an old friend of mine who basically he loved his drinks. And when you'd go to his house, he had this wonderful spot in upstate or not upstate, it was Hudson River Valley. And he had a horse and the horse every day you could see if you went there, the horse was knocking the apples, knocking his head against the apple tree so that the apples would drop. But then the horse waited until they fermented to eat them. <laughs> yeah. So are other, is it, it's not, is it not just humans who are alcohol seeking? Is it, is other species as well? Yeah. So, you know, how fruit that has fermented enough that it's starting to produce alcohol has got a lot of sugar in it too, and a lot mm. of calories. Right. And alcohol is actually a very important source of calories. It's got yeah. a lot of caloric content in the molecule which is why drinking is really bad if you're trying to lose weight. <laughs> right. So, so yeah, lots of, and other species also get the kick. So a standard story is that we, is a, what I call evolutionary hijack theory, that ethanol just happens to trigger this reward circuit in our brain for no good reason at all. And then we just figured this trick out and that's why we drink. And clearly that's why other species pursue alcohol when they can't because they have the same reward circuit so it does the same thing it just it can't be the whole story with humans <laughs> because we're the only species that has organized the large-scale production of alcohol and made it central to most of our social rituals and religious ritual and really it's the arguably the oldest thing we've been doing we've been getting together and producing and consuming alcohol for as long as we've been doing anything in an organized fashion as a species. And that's really unusual. And that's kind of the puzzle I want to answer is why are we so intent on doing this? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, people, whatever people go to a place, if they're, you know, colonizing a new area or their frontier, the first thing they do is figure out what can we ferment and, or they bring alcohol making equipment with them. It's really, it begs explanation why we we so intent on producing and consuming alcohol. And the, I argue that just the mistake or byproduct theory isn't convincing. Again, given the extreme costs. Yeah, I agree with that. And in, the, in your work, you also point out that it predates agriculture itself, right? So yeah, alcohol was more important to our early ancestors than food <laughs> in a way, yeah. right? Because yeah. they exerted their efforts there. And then that kind of led to, oh, you know, maybe we should like start growing food too. Yeah. So, so I am fascinated by that idea. I had a, uh, a scholar named Brian Maru Marescu on who wrote a book called The Religion with No Name. And it was essentially a look at some of the early Greek cults, you know, the mysteries of Elysium and the cults of Dionysus, et cetera. And his thesis was that not only were they packing a punch with the alcohol side of what they were serving at the gatherings, but they were also doing rudimentary psychedelics in them. And that, you know, there, as he joked to me once that their sales pitch line was, you know, almost, you just, you had to do it because it was come w to our, our gathering and speak with the gods. So, mm -hmm. so what do you think about other drugs uh, outside of alcohol, like specifically psychedelics where the self is essentially obliterated yeah. and, but you're also, I think not in a condition where like your writing of the first several pages, right? With yeah. point oh eight, you were still able to write those great pages. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas that doesn't really happen with psychedelics, right? Yeah. So I do talk about other chemical intoxicants and I talk about psychedelics. Psychedelics are doing some very similar things as alcohols do. So they're kind of depatterning the brain, they're allowing this crosstalk. The difference is they're doing it in a really extreme way. <laughs> So they're completely disassociating you from reality, completely depatterning your mind. And for a long period of time, typically, you know, most hallucinogen trips last four or six hours. And so they're important. I think that Michael Pollan has got this really good analogy, I think, where he, he argues that psychedelics are for cultural evolution, what mutagens are for genetic evolution. So for 
you know, evolution of work, we need a lot of variation. We need to kick up a lot of variation. Most of that variation is going to be useless and, or even harmful in the same, you know, most genetic mutations are harmful. And yet every once in a while, there'll be one that's useful and then adoption can lock onto that and select that. His argument is that psychedelics are this tool we use to just rattle, you know, rattle up the brain, produce completely random stuff. And 99% of that's going to be garbage or nonsense. But every once in a while, maybe there's an important insight out of there. Alcohol is doing a very similar thing, just much more mildly. And that's why I think alcohol is the daily social drug that people use. Typically in most cultures, psychedelics are reserved for either special occasions. So in cultures where everyone uses them, it's rarely, you don't do it every night. Right. And, but, and if you're using it regularly, it's a specialized class who's using it regularly. So sometimes the way cultures deal with this is designate a certain group of people who, you know, shamans or priests and yep. their job is to be doing hallucinogens all the time and coming up with crazy stuff and some of it's going to be useful. So it's either done rarely or it's done by a specialized class. And they just psychedelics are too powerful to incorporate into everyday life, everyday rituals. And so that's why humans, you know, it's just like we have different tools. You, know, you use a different size hammer when you're doing one job as opposed to another. We have this problem. We need to come up with a new insight. Does it need to be a really, really new insight? <laughs> well, then maybe we need to go in the desert and eat peyote. Yeah. Is it just that? the beginning of my book proposal sucks and I need to come up with a catcher beginning, maybe I'll just have a Negroni. It really is humans use different power tools to do different jobs, but uh, yeah. it's a spectrum, right? So psychedelics are just way farther along on the spectrum in terms of disassociating you than alcohol is. Yeah, totally agree. And also, you know, Timothy Leary, the poster boy who yeah. really wasn't and shouldn't have been made into the poster boy that Nixon made him into, had a really interesting kind of metaprogramming idea, which I'm sure you're familiar with, where he believed that, you know, the imprinting of the kind of the basic top, he called it top dog, bottom dog, winner script, loser script. These are all his words, not mine. And then when you keep going up his chain, he gets to this idea of metaprogramming. And he says, the only way you can do that is with psychedelic and, you know, so, so they might have a different use case there, but as I'm looking at my go to notes and listening to you, we've already come to the section on what the unconscious, because I'm wondering how much like it, it, we're talking about, you know, your idea of beer before bread, <laughs> desire to drink, you know, predates everything. I wonder how much of that is is for the reason that you used it for with the opening of your book. In other words, how much of it do you think is just was either an unplanned discovery, like, you know, Kent Stanley, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he's kind of got this stepping stone idea about the way we should kind of, his is, it's if you really want to have a great experience in life, be much more open to, don't set some goal, and then say, I must work towards this goal. Rather say, this is the direction or the journey I wish to go in and just pay attention. He says, you go from stepping stone to stepping stone and each time you uncover some new learning, it's a bit like we we'll in that you only uncover it if you're not looking for it, according to Ken. And so I wonder, um, do you think that the idea of the introduction of the alcohol and it shuts down the prefrontal cortex, right, temporarily, and that does then does that mean that it's like we are being ruled entirely by our unconscious or subconscious or no? It's just allowing the unconscious a little bit more power. It's essentially taking away the playground monitor for a little while. So the goal of the POC is to just monitor hot systems and know notice when they're going wrong or correct them. And that's gone to a certain extent. And that's important when the hot systems need to do their job. So this idea of stepping stones is very similar in the skill that the fact that experts, so again, like let's say skilled athletes, professional athletes, they don't, if Roger Federer wants to put a backhand down the line, he's not thinking about 
how he needs to move his racket to do that or how his arm needs to move. He's thinking about putting it back. So he has, he's, his brain sets a goal and then his body just knows how to do it. And that's important. So again, if you, if we asked him to describe, to remember and describe to us later how you did that, he wouldn't do it very well. So there are a lot of goals like that where you need to just shut down, you need to shut down the cognitive control systems to do well. So, so one of the, one of those goals is creativity. And that's one of the important functions I discuss in drunk. The other is trust. So the other big function I think of alcohol historically has been in the service of creating trust and bonding between people. So, you know, you talked a little bit about one of the features of us as a species is we're pretty useless as individuals, pack animals, and we're completely dependent. Unlike chimpanzees and other primates, we're just useless on our own. We're not very strong. We're actually not particularly that smart on our own because we tap into collective brains that humans together were together to come up with solutions to things and then pass down those solutions using culture. So that's what makes us powerful is culture and the ability to work together. But that requires working together and trust. And the weird thing I argue in drunk, we occupy this odd as a species, an odd ecological niche where we're primates. And a lot of our basic instincts and in biology is very similar to the chimpanzee. But the way, if you look at the way we live, especially in large scale post-agricultural societies, the way we cooperate looks a lot more like social insects. We look like ants or bees. And you would never see an army of chimpanzees going into battle together, you know, all lined up and organized, <laughs> you know, that's just not how it works. And yet humans line up and go into battle. Humans line up and get on an airplane and sit in close quarters. That would, a chimpan chimpanzees would tear each other apart if they were forced together like that. And yet we sit and eat our crackers and behave for the most part. So humans are really domesticated and obedient and cooperative. And one of the reasons is how we manage to do that, especially with non-kin. It's collaborating with non-kin all the time and often in one-off interactions. So interactions where we're never going to see the person again. One of the tools that we use to make this work is religion. So this is something I've argued in my previous work, that a belief in certain types of deities, engaging in certain types of rituals, helps to create a sense of bonding that help people to cooperate. But another way we do it is alcohol. So there's a reason that anytime you have potentially hostile individuals, or at least individuals with potentially differing interests who need to sit down and come to an agreement or figure something out, they don't start talking until they've gotten drunk, right? The, they eat and they drink. Or they use some other chemical intoxicant that has very similar effects. And that's because the other function of downregulating the PFC is that it's hard for you to lie. It's a kind of truth serum. So if I've downregulated your P lying is a really cognitively challenging task. If I'm trying to lie to you about something, I have to keep in my mind simultaneously in real time, both what I'm telling you is the truth and what I know to be the truth. And I have to keep them separate. Any emotional reactions that I have that are about that other thing that's not true, that's the truth, but I'm not telling you, I have to suppress those reactions. And then I have to simulate new reactions that correspond to the lie I'm telling you. It's really you're revving up your PFC to lie. If I then, before I start to ask you about something, I give you a couple of shots of vodka. I basically impaired your lying mechanism. It's going to be harder for you to convince me that you're trustworthy if you're not. So it's downregulating the PFC in a way that makes it harder to lie. It's also the other main effect of alcohol is it's boosting these prosocial hormones. So it's boosting serotonin, dopamine which just makes you less likely to want to lie because you're feeling cooperative and you're feeling happy about yourself and other people. So it's a drug that we use to help people ease into and maintain social relations, which is crucial for us as a species. Yeah. And of course, in vino veritas is a well-known 
Latin phrase for good reason. I wondered, I, as I was getting ready for this and going through some of my notes on your stuff, I did wonder, though, about like the idea that it, it is, to be honest, is that the animalistic self exclusively? Because I would say there's an alternate model to honesty, right? And that is that there are layers to honesty that get put by the prefrontal cortex, right? That, that like, okay, so I have to be empathetic or I have to be, you know, I don't want to hurt that person that my mom used to call them white lies. I don't know if, if everyone's mom called them white lies, but um, I wonder about that. I wonder your reaction to that. I mean, because, you know, it, to show compassion, to be empathetic, th those are seem to me at least to be functions of the prefrontal cortex and kind of the planning and if then, and the ability to you know, think about what can happen in the future from our actions now, or is it, or, or am I wrong? And is it truly the, you know, I don't know if you know the work of Jed McKenna, but he basically says we are a fear-based animal human and it guides us, emotions guide like virtually everything we do. And, you know, the prefrontal cortex kind of saved us, if you will, from that more animalistic side of life. But I don't know. What do you think? Our unconstrained emotional core, if we shut off the prefrontal cortex, right, we are going into a completely different part of our being. And we've all had the experience of like getting drunk in vino veritas, saying something that maybe impulsively that we might be feeling at that moment but if, if we really examine our lives and I don't, and, you know, I do it through journaling, other people do it through other methods, we really don't believe. So it was almost like what we said wasn't really the truth. It wasn't really honest. It was a spontaneous feeling at that moment of exhilaration that we were getting from, as you mentioned, all of the chemical dumps that happen with alcohol are well-known and well-documented. What do you think about that? I mean, certainly... If you tr take away the playground, all sorts of stuff could happen. Right? And that's why, especially at really high levels of inebriation, very dangerous things can happen, right? People, you disinhibit people too much, it could be bad. But, you know, people who get mean when they drink typically are mean people. And they just learn to be not mean in daily life through cognitive control. And it, the, you know, the meanness comes out when that's taken down. You may say things that, your conscious mind doesn't feel. So there's a feeling that rush of serotonin and dopamine can certainly make you feel closer to people in the moment than you really feel like the next morning when the PSC is in charge again and all that, those hormones are gone. So that's one way in which it could be misleading. You know, oh, I love you guys. You're my best friend. <laughs> you're like, well, <laughs> in retrospect. But it is, you know, there's something... We humans seem to find it useful to get a a read of what people are like when the playground monitor is not in charge. And we've historically found that important and there is some value to it. But certainly, you know, it impairs your ability to be polite, which could be good and bad, right? Maybe I want to know what you really think about. Maybe it's not nice for you to tell me what you really think about my book, but I actually want to know what you really think. Then I'm going to want to get you a little drunk first before I ask you. And you'll be rude. You know, maybe because you're not, you need the PFC to engage in certain types of politeness and compassion. So it, again, it's not a cure-all. It's not like everyone being time would be the best way to engage in society. Right? It's a tool. Yeah. It's a tool that we use selectively in certain situations when it's useful. Yeah. Uh, and I think it is useful in some situations. I agree. And I think your work is absolutely fascinating. And highly recommend it to our listeners. I can't believe, you know, like, I think we were in, well, we, because it's already an hour and a half since we started. Yeah. Recording. Yeah. I can't believe that. I honestly can't believe that. So this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for coming on. Your work is great. What, what's next? Do you have something in the works right now? The next book is probably going to be an academic book about ah. vir virtue ethics and moral perception and early Confucianism. But then the next trade book is going to be about this theme I touched on briefly of the importance of 
the physical world and contact with the physical Interesting. world. Interesting. Interesting. So, well-timed. Well-timed as well. Well, thank you. This has been really fun for me. What we do at the end of every podcast is we wave a wand and we make you magical in the sense that you get to speak into a little magic microphone two two ideas or concepts that are going to incept all humans on the planet. They're going to wake up the next day, think it's their idea, right? So they won't even know that you didn't plant this idea in them. They're going to wake up and think they did it, a bit like the thing on the best government that Lao Tzu has. The best leader is the one where yeah. the people say we did it ourselves, right? So you get to incept two things. In all of humanity, what two, okay. what two, yeah, what two are you going to, what two are you going to accept? Stop pushing so hard. That's a good one. Be one of them. And maybe the other is go walk in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Some version of that. I'll tell you what, if I love those, because if you did just those two, if every human just did those two things. Life would be a lot better and the world would be a much better place, in my opinion. So I, I love them both. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate yeah, it. Thanks.